the stage is yours. Um, for all the participants, please keep muted all the time. Please also turn off your camera and use the chat for any questions. And in order to see the presentation in full screen, I would like to ask you to click at the three dots on the lower left corner and to choose fit to frame. Thank you so much. OK, welcome to our second virtual CERC meeting, compression therapy, back to the future. We, we are happy that there are so many friends with us and we are all missing the personal contact face to face. We would be happy to have with you, let's say, a good scientific program face to face, a nice dinner, singing some songs at the end of a dinner, having a good glass of wine, uh, maybe Italian food like the last time in Bologna. But unfortunately, this is not possible this year. But we really hope that next year we can do it again, maybe in Russia or Italy or wherever. But I would like to welcome you for this meeting. And I can only say, um, CERC is the abbreviation for Center of Interdisciplinary Research on Compression. Hugo Patsch is the godfather of CERC. His idea was to bring together international experts all over the world for an interdisciplinary research on compression. And I have a big pleasure that Hugo is joining us today. And you can see him maybe. Uh, he is really happy that he can see all of you. And I should say warm greetings from Hugo to all of you. It's a big pleasure. And um, I would like to hand over to Attilio and Eberhard, who are the chairman of the first session. But thank you for your participation. Thank you for your passion and motivation for compression. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Uwe. Uh, my role is just to introduce, let's say, what we have to do today. Together with Evera, we will chair the first session. Uh, let's say that uh, somehow we have to remind everybody, uh, apart from muting, uh, that the question will be posed, will be asked through the chat. So whenever you want to ask a question, you put into the chat and I and Evera somehow will pass the questions to the speakers after the end of the first session. And then uh, let's say um, that will happen also for the second session. We have two sessions today for about two hour and a half uh, conference. And uh, of course, we kindly ask you everybody, I mean the speakers to respect the time. So to have the what we call the fruitful discussion at the end of each session. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Eberar, who will start the session with the first speaker. And again, thanks a lot for being here, but indeed we need human contact. So let's do our best to be all together in the very next future. Eberar, it's your turn. Thank you very much again. Primary or secondary obstruction or occlusion, any role for lower limb compression stockings, it, that's just really an issue which had been widely discussed uh, in the in the last years and the presentation will be by Dr. Huang Sheng from China please okay good afternoon Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen <clears throat> this is Dr. Huang in Shanghai and thanks to many company to give me a chance to take a presentation here I usually focus on surgical and endovascular therapy of vascular disease. So if there is a mistake here, please point it out without hesitation. And my topic is, is the iliocable primary and secondary obstruction occlusion energy for lower limb compression stockings. As we know, iliocable primary and secondary obstruction, we use the acute deep venous thrombosis, also the proximal, and the crocodile one is we call it non-thrombotic iliac vein compression syndromes, or we call it Maternal syndrome two. And uh, the post-thrombotic syndrome is very common in the clinic. Do you have a professor um, any slide to show? Yes. If you can share the your slider, please. Yes, is, is, is that the, the slider cannot be shared? Not so far. 
If you share your presentation. Lisa? Oh, yes. Yes. Is that okay? Perfect. Yes, perfect. It's on full screen now. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, boy. So continue. And as very rare is the PTS combined with the AV vistula and the cancer related alio cavity obstruction. Let me first see the case. The case is a very old man. He has a pain and edema for left legs for two weeks. And after the left knee surgery in 2017, the histories in 2002, he had, he had a deep venous thrombosis and acquired the CBT and PT and stent. After that, anticoagulation for two years, wearing <coughs> elastic compression stockings discontinuously. But now he is too old. He was too old to for inappropriate for the CDT again. So we choose the, the mechanic thrombolysis. Here is a venography, and we can find it uh, some damage to the former, the older stand. Before it, we implanted the in the camera filter to avoid the pulmonary embolization. And after that, the mechanic thrombolysis, and then the PTA and the stent implantation. For the old thrombi, we used the manual aspiration. Here is a compilation angiography. It's patent. It was patent, and we retrieved retrieved the filter simultaneously to avoid another admission. Post operation. He acquired the anticoagulation, no wearing the elastic compression stockings. And during the follow ups, no recurrence. To avoid hemorrhage, the mechanical thrombolysis is superior to the catheter directed thrombolysis. The symptoms of venous hypertension were elevated immediately. And we know after DVT, nearly more than 30% of patients develop PTS. PTS is a chronic condition characterized by many <coughs> very <coughs> seriously the symptoms. PTS is a serious application with substantial impact on quality of life and costs. Because an effective therapy is lacking, prevention is of major importance. So in 2012, the UK NICE recommended that patients with acute proximal DVT should wear as a BTK elastic compression stocking for at least two years to reduce the incidence of PTS. This compression was based on findings from two small ICTs. But however, in 2012 and 15, NICE reversed their former recommendation stating do not offer graduated compression stockings to prevent PTS after proximal deep DVTs. The reversal followed the publication of the SOX trial which was more than twice as large as the two previous ICTs, has uh, 803 patients and compared the use of active elastic compression stockings with placeable elastic compression stockings for two years. Here is a SOX. The findings from 2004 and 2010, 410 patient, patients were randomly assigned to receive active ECS and the 360, 96 placeable ECS. The cumulative incidence of PTS was 14.2% uh, in active ECS versus 12.7% in placeable ECS. The result was similar in a prescribed per protocol analysis of patients who reported frequent using of stockings. Here is the outcome by the treatment. We know the primary outcome and secondary outcome it has been suggested that the SOX trial could have been negative because of poor compliance, as only 56% of patients were using stockings for three days a week or more at the end of the study, but no effect occurred in the subgroup of second use, and the trial design in many ways improved on the design of previously open level studies. Limitation of this study was that 14% of one, four, uh, 800 per month and patients withdraw or were lost to follow up. Also, SOX trial such results suggest that the elastic trial, trial might not affect the natural history of PTS. 
developed after DVTs, whether compression stockings might be benefit to improve sy symptoms of established PTS or of acute DVTs warrant assessment in the future studies. Before the SOX trial was published, the two studies were designed to see whether it was necessary to wear stockings for four to two years in the first study of Octavia, assigned for 519 patients to either wearing compression. <clears throat> for, for either one year or four or two years, a greater number of patients <clears throat> who stop wearing stockings at one year and at PTS at two years, then to then did those assigned to wear them for two years. The investigators conclude that stopping compression uh, stockings at 12 months was inferior to the standard duration of 24 months. Based on the current knowledge, the standard application of ECS therapy after DVT is questioned. So the idea DVT study has addressed the central questions that remain unanswered. The first one is which individual patients benefit from ECS therapy and with what is the optimal individual treatment duration. In the in this study shows that after <coughs> the 865 patients wearing the compression stockings for either two years or for an individual duration, six months, one year or two years, depending on the serially assessed result scores, there will no between group difference in the number of the patients who have PTS at two years. And the absolute difference was 1.1%, meeting the non-inferior non -inferior margin of 70.5. The colleagues conclude that stopping treatment at 6 or 12 months in selected patients was not inferior to the standard duration of 24 months. Furthermore, 266 of 432 patients in the individualized patients groups was advised that they could stop wearing stockings after six months. How do we interpret the findings from this trial? Is the outcomes of by the treatment group? And in this paper, the also uh, these five RCTs, small RCTs, uh, three support the uh, prescription of MCS to prevent development of PDT and uh, two objected. So there is still controversies. And looking into the future, several studies have been done to evaluate the effect of ECS in reducing the intensity of PTS. Some studies have shown benefit on the application of the, this ECS therapy in patients with acute proximal DV, but SOX did not. The, and the two randomizers report the benefit from elastic compression stocking therapy. Although the subject that remains somewhat controversial, the general belief is that when properly applied, elastic compression stockings benefit the patient with around a 30% reduction in PTS. Nonetheless, ideal is a step in a positive direction, opening the door for further and management and prevention of the PTS. So, the Professor Rabi, and he has a scientific summary for it published in the Flabology in 2018 and the recommendation for acute DVTs we in command the immediate compression to reduce pain and swelling and the immediate compressions and the mobilizations in addition to anticoagulation to avoid the thrombus propagations in acute DVTs and also use of medical compression stocks as early as possible after diagnosis of DVTs in order to prevent PTS. But there are comment Current evidence still support compression therapies for PTS pro practice in clinical practice, at least in symptomatic patients. For chronic iliocavial occlusive disease, now here are the cases for the maintainer, maternal syndrome. He has a varicose veins of left and ulcer for two months. He has a pigmentation and ulcer. And that before the, we have, before the the varicose vein surgery ascending venography shows that the left common iliac vein obstruction and collateral circulations. And first, we do the radio frequency. And after that, we do the iliac vein PTAs and the stent. And after that, the medications and the 
graduated elastic compression stockings and resins after four months later, the also healed. The venous insufficient following DVTs is low as the PTS, symptoms run from the mild to severe. Treatment involves a combination of therapy, including compression stockings, venous dentings for outflow obstruction, and some in instance deep venous bypass. Here is a, a special case is a filter associated with inferior venal cava associated progress. Here's a female at the right lower limb swelling for two, three years, lower lower he had planned an uh, inferior renal cover filter three years ago. And after that, we have the CTV shows that the uh, renal cover can iliovial cavers obstruction. That's a renal graphy in both limbs. And in left limbs after she's insertions and PMTs with, with also with the androjet, with the androjet pulse power. PMT right iliac. Kissing stent in the inferior venal cavity and both iliac in iliac cavity. And the final imaging, the morphology between the stent and the filter, we can see the stent is inside the filter. After that, the anticoagulations for six months is compression therapy follow up success. Here is also a special PTS. He has a PTS with a and uh, arterial venal fistula is from the hypogastric. We can see the so the fistula is secondary to the iliac vein occlusion, which will result in venous hypertension more severely. It is better to treat the lesion by opening the iliac vein firstly. If the fistula is embolized only by the arterial approach and the vein is not open, the pathophysiologic basis is still be cannot be removed. The fist, fistula will relapse. And the, within the, the follow up, it's apparently. And after 25 months follow up anticoagulation, we can also see the pigmentations. And so we advise the, the patient to wear the elastic compression stockings continuously. So for the chronic ileal primary or secondary obstruction, ECS had long been thought to be reduced the PTS by improving venous returns and preventing venous pooling. Data on the physical management of PTS as bus, the most valuable data are obtained from the ulcer's healing studies. Because the ulcer of venous legs are considered the severest form of PTS, and PTS are the main causes of the isolation in many cases. So the indication for also uh, Professor Rabbit's reviews suggestions that the use of the medical compression stockings for the treatment of symptomatic PTS, but the level is grade 1B. So have a brief summary. Although the elastic compression stockings did not prevent PTS after the first proximal DVTs, we still suggest the acute DVTs patients rotating well the stockings, which could help to relieve symptoms such as pains, heaviness, wellness of venous hypertension. Also can be helpful to healing of the chronic ulcers caused by the maternal syndrome. In our center, most of the patients with proximal DVTs acquired mechanical thrombolysis and anticoagulations. If the velator skill is milder, stockings are not to be necessary during the follow-ups, but if the has a moderate symptoms. The data and personal experience about compression in lipedema, also a very interesting and hot topic. Please, Dr. Chulnoki. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Eberhard. So, so the conference jumped to me and I tried to share my screen. Yes, I hope you can hear me. Yes. It works. And see as well. Okay, so uh, Atilio Eberhard, I'm especially grateful to the kind invitation to speak about uh, compression lipedema, which is going to be a very simplified talk. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. 
And when we take into account the characteristic clinical picture of lipedema, we see relatively slim upper and the more robust lower body half, making the body composition described by a bilateral, symmetrical, and disproportional adiposity, highlighted by knee fat pads and uninvolved feet. Briefly, lipedema is uh, not a true edema, but a peculiar and symmetrical uh, fatty enlargement. In terms of general findings, lipedema is typically a feminine disease uh, with familial affection and hormonal influence, which is associated with the spontaneous or mild trauma induced pain and easy bruising. Uh, despite of uh, usually higher BMI, uh, metabolic disorders and hypertension are relatively rare. Uh, there is a relative unresponsiveness to dietary approaches and lifestyle changes. Weight and joint involvement can also be mentioned. Earlier findings showed the abnormal morphology of lymphatic capillaries detected by fluoroscopy and enlarged lymphatic collectors proven by MRI lymphography. Functional tests involving the largest patient cohort uh, provided by Isabel Forner or Spanish friend uh, <coughs> clearly showed that nearly half of the patients had mild or moderate lymphatic insufficiency. So uh, these are the uh, main objectives of compression in lipedema, which comprise the alleviating of discomfort and pain, streamlining distorted limb shapes, reducing limb volumes to a minor degree in uncombined lipedema by evacuating adipose tissue associated fluid, reducing inflammation in subcutaneous tissue, uh, improving patient's mobility, and if uh, it is feasible, uh, we perhaps could prevent progression and improve lymphatic function. The first six goals are found to be implementable. However, the last two, preventing progression and improving lymphatic function, have remained pretty uncertain. Turning to compression treatment, first I talk about the elaboration of intensive decongestion. Compression bandages are usually parts of decongestive lymphatic therapy that significantly but modestly reduce limb volume, but very efficiently decrease pain perception and uh, capillary fragility. We prefer the use of short stretch bandages, however, in case of robust fat deposition or uh, weak uh, muscle pump function, long stretch material can be as well applied. Intermittent pneumatic pumps could also contribute to a modest but significant volume reduction. In maintenance treatment, uh, the easiest way of compression is the application of ready-to-wear uh, round-knitted garments of medium pressure range, which usually, usually fits to less advanced stages, and footless leggings uh, can also be worn accordingly. Lipedematous arms uh, could be sufficiently treated with round knitted arm sleeves. Uh, we have also proven that uh, lipedema patients equally tolerate uh, garments with moderate and high pressures. As patient selection is needed, as round knitted garments are not eligible for uneven limb shapes, as it is demonstrated by this slide. This is why we very often apply flat knitted garments that streamline irregular leg shapes, cause uh, symptomatic relief and easier mobility. Uh, we can have creative combinations to facilitate donning, doffing and wearability, such as a capri hose combined with up to knee stockings. Interestingly, we measured no statistical differences in terms of static stiffness indices, uh, between round and flat knitted pantyhoses of the same pressure range. As we all know, Velcro wraps have gained uh, fairly high popularity in, rec in uh, recent time. So far, just case reports are available in lipedema uh, field 
in the treatment of lipedema with Walker reps. However, larger studies are warranted because their use in lipedema is rational owing to the easy application uh, that can facilitate self-management. Finally, I thank you for your attention and I wish you <clears throat> Easter greetings from Seged, Hungary. Thank you so much. Thank you, Uwe. Uh, Heber, should, you should unmute. Hey, sorry, sorry. Thank okay. you very much uh, again for this uh, nice presentation. I think it, uh, lipedema and compression is a very interesting topic and we will discuss this later. Uh, and we are looking now if uh, the last presentation by Dr. Makoto is ready to be presented, I think. If Mo is not ready. Can you see the mice right? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Now. If you can can you hear me? Fine. Yeah. Yes. Now you can go ahead, Mo. Okay. So my presentation does compression slow than varicose pain and uh, natural history. Uh, natural history demonstrate like a bone vein study, the about 30% uh, of the uh, natural history, the uh, percentage of patient have a uh, uh, progression of the varicose pain over six and 6.6 uh, 6 years. And also a Dean Bain study, uh, general population, and the incidence of reflux is about 12% over 13 years. Annual incidence of the reflux is 0.9%. So varicose pain uh, always uh, progress. And this is a progression by in the low wife therapy in the patient waiting for the surgery. And same data, uh, this is this data uh, demonstrated nearly one third of the patient with a venous reflux has a progression with the duplexion and the clinically. And the biomechanical response of the varicose pain to the relaxed compression as a numerically studied. And uh, this the this study demonstrates external compression is effective in decreasing transmural pressure. So maybe theoretically, varicose pain can prevent the progression of the by compression therapy. But uh, so far, it is not justified to follow up the symptomatic. Saffinous varicose pain just with compression starting from. Oh, it's not working. Then, uh, if the surgery is uh, uh, possible, and the probably surgery is better according to randomized control study, so there is no space for the uh, uh, compression uh, therapy uh, if the patient is symptomatic by uh, softness, uh varicose pain. And uh, so, in the guideline said, stroking alone is not recommended for symptomatic primary varicose pain at if invasive treatment is possible. And the indication of long-term use of compression stocking and the probably the, uh, the perioperative uh, stocking use of prevention of complication might be a small number. And the post-operative varicose pain with skin disease, they need a long-term compression stocking. And asymptomatic varicose pain for the prevention of future deterioration is it just for you or not? Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. So maybe I'm going to continue the presentation. Is it okay? Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. So use a compression stocking for the patient with the varicose pain with clinical symptom. I asked a Japanese doctor by questionnaire. And uh, no symptom patient with varicose pain. Uh, those doctors are huge, uh, very, uh, they, uh, they are specialized to varicose vein surgery. And two doctors said they use uh, compression stocking, even though patients do not have a symptom. And a patient, uh, eight doctors said, no, uh, they don't use a compression stocking. And uh, two doctors said, if yes, if the patient wish. So depends on patient. So this is actual reality in Japanese doctors. 
but some patients wear compression stocking even with difficulty because doctor said to wear them because the Japanese are patient are very uh, very good patients. So, but we have to think about whether this is okay or not. And, and there is no evidence to prevent her, uh, progression of the stocking in asymptomatic varicose pain to, uh, according to a systematic review in 2009. But the two studies, the several study is published already. And the venous function deteriorate in patient waiting for the varicose pain surgery, even with compression stocking. This is published in 1993 in Dr. Sarin. They use a duplex scanning. And also there is a clinical progression of varicose pain, even with a stocking. And the degree of the venous diffrax in the mainly femoral vein was studied by Dr. Luri in 1998. And this study demonstrates elastic compression alone is a poor clinical and hemodynamic result. So this is not recommended. And also COTAS, this is the most well-studied study. And uh, this is a, a, a study the long-term characteristic the chronic venous disease progression and the correlation with the modification of the risk factor. And this study is a contralateral limb of 73 patients of the saphenous pain surgery. And the five-year follow-up was performed. And the uh, definition of the stocking use more than eight hours, so eight hours per day. And uh, 48, uh, after five years, 52% of the patient have the new site of refrax. And CIP classification uh, score significant deteriorated. And the patient compliance stocking was low. And this is a CIP classification uh, before zero, uh, advanced to the four, three and four. So more than 30% uh, of the patient progress to uh, C3 disease. And this is a detail. This is the detail of the uh, detail of the progression. And uh, when we uh, see the C score, it increased, A score increased, disability score increased, severity score is a total. So clinical score is increased after five years in unaffected uh, varicose vein limb. And elastic stocking use was initially 46% of patients used, and they are asked to use a compression stocking, but after five years, only 33% of the patient use a compression stocking. So compliance is not good. So according to the study, if uh, this is a no progression, progression is the percentage of patient, and so maintained uh, compression stocking all the time, there is no progression of the uh, varicose pain. But if the patient do not wear compression stocking at all from the initially and during follow-up, a lot of patient has a progression of the uh, varicose pain. So conclusion is uh, conclusion of this study is obesity, uh, orthostatism, and non-compliance with uh, rest of compression stocking is the independent risk factor for uh, uh, varicose pain progression. So this study demonstrates systemic elastic compression use may be recommended. And another study is uh, to determine the efficacy of the compression stocking in prevention of the emergent varicose pain in pregnancy patient. This is a small RCT. And the patient is uh, divided into three and uh, no stocking and the cross one stocking in the left leg, cross two stocking in the right leg. And the group two is uh, reversed. So reversed on the cross one and the cross two. And the uh, appearance of compression stocking failed to prevent the emergence of the superficial varicose pain. The, the emergence uh, appearance of varicose pain is almost the same. But they found uh, compression stocking decreased the long saphenous vein uh, reflux at the saphenous femoral junction. And uh, if they don't wear compression stocking, four out of 15 have a uh, reflux at the saphenous femoral junction. But if they use a compression stocking, only one out of 27 patients have a compression uh, uh, reflux at the saphenous femoral junction.
And the symptom is, of course, uh, of course, uh, improved by compression stocking. So discussion of the, this study is the compression uh, prevent the long saphenous vein refract at the saphenous thermal junction while significant, significant decrease the leg symptom. So prevention long saphenous vein uh, refract may be associated lower incident long saphenous varicose vein and the compression stock it could make an important contribution to the prevention varicose vein change in pregnancy. But because of the uh, those are just a too insufficient data, so this is a, a Dr. Lavis uh, guideline. Insufficient data is available on the use of medical compression stocking for prevention of chronic penis disease in progression. And uh, SVS, nice guideline, as a systemic review at all, uh, including Cochrane, de Cochrane review, uh, a kind of deny to use a compression stocking. And if we use a compression stocking for prevention of the progression of the uh, varicose vein, low adherence is might be a problem. Even the compression stocking known for low adherence, even in sick ulcer patient, is that we use a compression stocking for asymptomatic varicose vein patient, it might be very difficult to for the patient to wear compression stocking, as shown by Dr. Kota's study. But uh, CBD is very important. Uh, recently, recent published demonstrate uh, individual with chronic venous insufficiency experience uh, elevate the risk of the death, uh, which is independent the age and sex and uh, present uh, uh, present risk, cardiovascular risk factor and comorbidity. If a CIP classification increase, there is more CV death. Uh, according to the European Heart Journal study of this year. So conclusion is a compression stocking may slow down the progression by cause pain, but the evidence is limited and it is not adopted guideline recommendation. Poor adherence of symptomatic patients suggest a decrease of quality of life and when they are asked wear, wearing compression stocking. It is necessary to, to develop easy to wear and comfortable stocking, which does not reduce the cure and improve natural history of bicosting and maybe the uh, complicated uh, CV death. Thank you very much. Sorry for the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation. We will come back later for the discussion. And uh, now we come to the last presentation in this session. And this is by Sergio Genesini from Italy on optimal pressure of compression in lymphedema. Sergio, please. Thank you so much, Professor Rabe. Thank you so much, everyone. In order to avoid technical issues, I sent the MP4 and I ask Elisa to play it, please. I'm Sergio Genesini and I've been asked about the optimal pressure of compression in lymphedema topic for which I have no conflict of interest to declare. Well, I declare myself puzzled by the quite uh, intriguing and uh, surely difficult question. There is a famous uh, Italian singer, Gino Paoli, who was singing Quattro Amici al Bar, Four Friends at the Bar, and that's what I thought it was with Attilia Friend before he made such a difficult question, and it's lovely to see indeed Abby uh, Kalodiki with us in the picture. The question is uh, difficult, a joke aside, uh, because we have just uh, four guidelines uh, as the four friends at the bar that are talking about uh, this. I uh, cannot topic. see the video anymore. Yeah, I don't indeed. know if it is my the issue. Them but... are updated uh, with uh, low quality references, and indeed uh, we see that even compression is receiving a very low recommendation, despite we know compression is the pillar for the treatment of uh, uh, lymphedema in particular. We knew about this already back in 2019, uh, together with Professor Parsh at the Big Winter meeting, uh, when we published uh, the similarities and controversies in the different uh, guidelines, and you can find uh, the full descriptive issue in uh, Phlebology Journal. We pointed out the importance of uh, the proper evidence-based data collection of the reproducibility and standardization of the data. If we don't have this, we cannot even state that CDP works, even if we know CDP is the corner so for the treatment of lymphedema, because we cannot really compare the data properly among themselves. 
same for compression in general in lymphedema and in specific with intermittent rheumatic compression that indeed is uh, requiring validation of the proper protocols so that we can have multicenter, for example, randomized comparative trials on that topic. You may remember another thing that Diana Washington was thinking about the difference that they makes. And in reality, we could change the water day with the millimeter of mercury and focus on the changes we can have with the different millimeter of mercury. But to understand this, first of all, we have to understand where we are applying this pressure. Because there are papers like this one showing that if we have the same interface pressure, but a different lengths, we can have a variation of up to 50% of pressure in the subcutaneous tissue. And this is in line with the flight study we did uh, regarding the edema on board, pointing out how you don't need that much pressure to create a tourniquet effect in presence in particular of edema. And even a normal SOX is showing indeed this tourniquet effect, and we see the shift of the fluids being not totally progressive or graduated uh, in a limb, as it is not totally graduated or progressive, the shift we have by applying a proper compression that is, of course, able to control edema in the whole limb, but at the same time in the different segments. There is variation based on the shape and based on the bony structures. And this is something we demonstrated also in another publication of our group where we standardized the protocol of sitting, standing, and walking in a standardized way on a treadmill, indeed showing the importance of measuring the circumference of the leg in the different parts, not in just one, because we might have a different ball-like shape structures with the consequent risk of applying even a progressive rather than graduated compression based on the shape of the limb. I really adore this statement by the giant Van der Strict. It is stating that we should know the history, so to avoid wasting our time, trying to open doors that were already opened by others. And by this, I mean that the same O'Donnell back in 1977 was uh, pointing out how we might have uh, different results of the same pressure based on the hemodynamics of uh, that leg and also on the firmness of the tissue fibrosis that is present in uh, that leg. And indeed, they were proposing cellular radiography at that time as a prognostic factor for the application of compression in a satisfying or not way. And now we have far more advanced devices like this one showing us the possibility of measuring the firmness of our subcutaneous tissue. We have to understand indeed uh, which kind of lymphedema we are talking uh, about. Are we talking about fluid? Are we talking about fibrotic, for example? And for this reason, uh, we also had a publication uh, with uh, dear friends and colleagues I'd like to thank International Angiology, pointing out uh, the characterization of uh, the edema in uh, a way that can be also used in a classification to be used for proper prescription of compression. The proper prescription must include the decision of the type of compression around and uh, flat uh, knit. Uh, there is a very interesting publication on the topic by the German colleagues and friends that is pointing out when we want to eventually use the flat, for example, in case of differences in circumference, in case of skin forms, and I would say also in case of hemodynamic knits. It's very important to focus also on the cost of uh, the prescription, meaning uh, that uh, we have uh, significant variations in the prices, as you can see, particularly considering uh, that we have a long-lasting disease. So whenever we choose, uh, of course, custom-made and flat, the cost is changing. But how much pressure in the end do we have to apply in the demon? Professor Pash taught us that we don't need to exaggerate. We have a limit over which we really don't need uh, to go, so 30 for the arm, 50, 60 for the lower limb. The professor Parsha very probably knew about the movie A Family Affair, because that's the title he gave together with Professor Lee to a very nice publication about the family affair of Danes and Felix. Now, this family affair is a little bit of a problem to me, because when we have papers like this one that are masterpieces in the literature, we should also remember that we are focusing mainly on venous edema in these papers, not on lymphedema, even if, of course, lymphedema and venous are insufficient are really close to each other. We should always uh, wonder if uh, the applied pressure is uh, the one that was declared in the publication. 
Are we really winning against the demon with the pressure that has been applied? Is the pressure really true? Because only 23.9% of the applications were really going to the target pressure according to publications like this one. And it's important that the pressure when never applied remains. So it's very important uh, to know that, of course, uh, with the uh, short stretch material, we might have a significant variation in the pressure in the following days that we don't have with adjustable compression wraps and with compression stockings, according to this interesting publication. The literature has been accumulating nowadays in terms of adjustable compression wraps, so we are filling the gap in terms of follow-up, uh, in terms of uh, clinical data, and indeed uh, we have promising, uh, promising results in terms of the cost of savings and improvement in quality of life. An example is pretty recent, uh, it's actually super recent, it is last uh, June from Borman uh, showing the comparison of adjustable compression wraps with multi-stretch multi-layer benches, showing how the volume uh, decreases in the same way and we have an improvement in terms of quality of life that is in favor of adjustable compression wraps. At the same time, we have finally data suggesting a protocol for the intermittent traumatic compression that we might use in Pedima for future multi trials. Remembering that the same chamber can create variations in the interface pressure that can have a consequence, of course, in lymphedema. And for this, we remember the magical power, let's say so, of uh, the best form of compression, I would say that is the one of water, because we know from the study now that uh, the vectors are all perpendicular in terms of forces on the surface in the aquatic environment, and we know that we have up to 80 millimeter mercury acting on our ankle when we are standing up at 120 centimeter of depth in a graduated way, for which we focused with our publication starting from 2017 with the first standardized uh, protocol of exercises in the aquatic environment in collecting that in a standardized, reproducible, uh, proper way, for which I'd like to deeply thank uh, Dr. Eric Menegatti involved uh, in this uh, project in the first slide. We demonstrated uh, back in 2017 the lower limb volume uh, variation and uh, the correlation with improvement in the anchor range of uh, motion and uh, the correlation with the uh, impedance parameters uh, variation following a standardized reproducible protocol. But we found nothing new once again uh, going back uh, to other strict because we know that Connors Jobs was already demonstrating the healing power of the aquatic environment in terms of the answer healing, in particular, thanks to the graduated compression. And if we go back to the 90s, we see the terms already reported improvements thanks to the aquatic environment. But of course, uh, in a not so standardized and reducible a way that makes the comparison quite uh, difficult. So it's quite pointless uh, to say who came first in reality, because uh, even before 2017, there was already ANS in 1992, there was Carpenter in 2009, and many others who reported the data on the topic. But first of all, there was already Hippocrates uh, talking about uh, the uh, importance of the aquatic environment, and before him, very probably someone else. But it's important that uh, we don't just talk about uh, the empirical uh, results, we just bring evidence-based uh, data in a scientific, reproducible, standardized way to avoid our patients to experience uh, a dive into an empty pool of uh, meaningful or not meaningful uh, data. And then, in conclusion, I would say that we should always remember that when we are prescribing a drug, we should have the same attention than when we are prescribing a, a compression uh, stocking. And indeed, we should uh, choose the proper dose, the proper type, the proper timing, uh, with uh, the knowledge that in this way we'll improve significantly uh, the quality of life and uh, the disease management for our patients who must be our ally in the use of uh, these compression products that must indeed uh, perfectly explain to them, because it has been explained by this paper of Raju back in 2007, how by educating our patients, we indeed increase uh, the potential compliance. And this has been uh, rephrased also recently by this nice publication showing how the knowledge of compression leads to proper prescriptions or proper attitude and proper behavior of the patients, focusing not just on physicians, but on all, all classes of healthcare professionals. In conclusion, I think in my opinion, the optimal pressure of compression is the one that the patient wears. No point in a good prescription if there is no use of that prescription. So compliance 
And then, of course, we have to choose the proper toes and the proper type based on the firmness and on the hemodynamic needs that we have needed to counteract, taking into consideration also the anatomical specific cases, taking into consideration only properly collected, standardized and reproducible data, only taking into consideration certified products. Because indeed, as we know, there is a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of uh, not certified products, up to 40% of medical websites, according to the literature, are including misinformation, for which I invite all of you to visit the Viewing Foundation webpage and report eventual encounter misinformation and report uh, valuable papers you think we should include in the consensus document that will be published in International Angiology at the end of 2022, together with a multilingual book for the patients and a digital related platform in the True Care campaign, together reporting on bias education, certification and regulatory education involving public family doctors and being empathic experts for the once in a lifetime opportunity of showcasing the importance of proper management of venous and lymphatic disease at the Universal Expo in Dubai next February. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are very late in time. It's uh, three o'clock. Um, I tell you, yeah. what can we do with questions? Yeah, so uh, I'm happy that anyway we are slightly, slightly late, just one minute, notwithstanding the technical issue. So if you agree, Emma, I can start with the very first questions to the first speaker. It's okay for you? Yes, please. Okay, so Professor Sheng received the question. Uh, can you hear me, Professor Sheng? Yes. Okay. So the first question to I you can, comes I, from a guest I, and uh, he asks or she asks, uh, do you always prescribe only knee high stockings with the diagnosis you have described? Yes, uh, thank you for your good questions and, uh, and we know it. Uh, for the idiocavus occlusive disease, the symptoms of this kind of patients have the more serious list symptoms and I often uh, prescribe the longer the knee high side uh, during high for this kind of patient because I think the the lung compression elastic compressions can give can afford enough compressions without the stocking slipper to the below the knee and the it that not mean that I did not prescribe uh, the below the, the BTK stockings for the distal deep venous thrombosis. I also prescribe the BTK stockings. And uh, and interesting in 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 Shanghai, uh, uh, in my patients, uh, the females likes to wear the knee high stockings and the, the the male did not like to his his side to be wrapped by the compression elastic stockings that's my answer okay i have just a little question to you just to, to go ahead with the discussion do you see any difference in the compression between uh, let's say the classical femoropopliteal thrombosis or as uh, this is your topic uh, the thrombosis or the obstruction in the iliocaval segment. I mean, in the ter in terms of prescription, do you see any difference? Yes, I think the first difference is the uh, is the symptoms. The higher the uh, obstruction, and uh, the more seriously uh, the symptoms. And uh, if the patients has the uh, iliocaval uh, obstructions and uh, the symptoms of venous hypertension is uh, he has a very seriously uh, symptoms of the venous hypertension and uh, the venous refluxes obstructions is high also. And you may I have a very short comment. Yeah, 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 please. We now do uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting topic and Hugo Parch always told us the most important thing is that you have to start immediately after the diagnosis of DVT with compression. And that was confirmed by the IDEAL study. There was a subgroup study of the IDEAL study published by Amin, and he could show 
if you compare immediate compression with later start of compression, you can see that in the immediate compression group, you have less, uh, less post-thrombotic syndrome with objective symptoms. And that was taken by two new Euro European gui international guidelines on deep venous thrombosis, because they recommend now also immediate start of compression treatment for an individualized uh, duration. Only the American uh, new guidelines do not recommend standard uh, use of compression treatment up to now. But that is a very interesting, I think, uh, development uh, for more compression and for immediate compression after DVT. Okay, is there any other question from the speakers? Because I don't see any other question from all the participants. Otherwise, we move to the second speaker. If any speaker wants to intervene. Okay, so thanks again, Professor Sheng. We go to the second speaker, Professor Mo. Uh, I have, uh, at least I have the very first question and then any other speaker or participant can write down any question. So, for Professor Mo, basically you showed that we have not uh, enough data to say if stockings prevent, let's say, uh, let's say not prevent, uh, slow down the progression because preventing is obviously impossible, but slow down the progression. And I think one issue is the compliance. You clearly demonstrated it. So mm -hmm. we have not enough data because of lack of compliance. Everybody would agree that walking or exercising, which is real life, could deteriorate varicose veins. So that's why stockings could be a valuable option waiting for any other treatment, invasive treatment, let's say. What do you think about that? Yes, uh, that might be true. But the problem is uh, because uh, compri compliance is low, because the patient is uh, uncomfortable wearing compression stocking. So it's kind of trade off, slow down the varicose pain and also daily quality of life. So if the compression stocking is very comfortable and uh, uh, there is no problem with patient with wearing compression stocking, of course, it's better to wear compression stocking. But uh, probably more uh, study about the lower pressure, comfortable stocking might uh, slow down the varicose pain might be uh, another issue. So maybe not all the patients, we can recommend the patient uh, wearing compression stocking. Maybe we need more study about the low pressure, comfortable stocking, which it slow down the uh, varicose pain progression. So that is my opinion. Is that is it the answer for you? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Any other question? Yeah, I, I have a comment because we have to, in my opinion, we have to differentiate between the progression of reflux and varicose veins itself and the progression mm -hmm. of chronic venous disease, let's say chronic venous insufficiency in special with objective signs and symptoms like the development mm -hmm. of edema and skin changes and so on. Mm -hmm. So these are two different issues. And mm -hmm. I th don't think that we can prevent development of varicose veins, uh, like in the study uh, for the, the you showed uh, by Tala with the, um, the pregnant women. But mm -hmm. we can prevent the development of edema, and we can prevent the development of skin changes and things like that. We know, for instance, and there are studies for that, that the development of recurrent ulcers can be prevented by wearing compression stockings. And that is also progression from healed ulcer to active ulcers. So in my opinion, it's two issues. It's one is chronic venous disease or chronic venous deficiency progression, and the other is varicose vein development and progression. And in the studies, yeah. this goes to and fro, and it's not very well differentiated in most of the studies. Mm -hmm. ah, I agree with that. But the, the problem is even though patient is a symptom, if the patient is is a symptom, it might be difficult for the patient to wear the compression stocking for the future deterioration of the skin disease. So maybe we need more improvement in the compression stocking. But I think Dr. Labe, that, that is true. We have to differentiate the varicose vein progression and the chronic venous insufficient progression. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you. I see no more slides at the moment, so we can move uh, if there is no more question from, uh, let's say. So now I have a question to Dr. Shornoki personally. So because we know that lipidema is a matter of fat and a matter of fluid. So is there any evidence if the compression works also on the fat deposition or is it just a matter of fluid? Because fluid we know, of course, compression moves away fluids. But what about the fat deposition? What about the lipodystrophy? Thank you for this important question. I kept searching for such an evidence, but failed to find one. But uh, I think a long-term follow-up would and uh, repeated uh, either zero radiography or CT or MRI scanning uh, could uh, uh, answer to this question because I'm, as well as you, I'm still curious for uh, for the answer whether a long-term compression with uh, an adherent compliance uh, could uh, somehow decrease the amount of fat. So I think I would, I, I'd be more than happy if someone in the uh, compression society would give us uh, some clue or some uh, uh, firm data on it, but uh, I have no idea. I have no can idea. I, can I say one word? Because yes. I'm quite good working, uh, quite well working with the bioimpedance. This is extremely interesting because you can measure, in fact, the fat the muscle and the fluid. You can differentiate, not just volumetry, but differentiating. It would be interesting to use, I mean, this bioimpedance to measure what happens to the fat composition of the tissues during compression. And we found some little change, of course, it, not just in one month, but you may try to measure it by bioimpedance. It's one option. Uh, thanks for this tip. Uh, I could agree. I could agree. Unfortunately, I have no personal experience with bioimpedance, but this is a simplified technique and I think it is easy to use uh, a device. Uh, so uh, uh, I think this is a very good suggestion. We have quite a lot of patients using uh, compression pantyhoses for lipedema. Yes, uh, for, a, for a prolonged period, uh, we could use it. Uh, thanks again for, for this proposal. There is an interesting point now that the actual uh, consensus documents in, in Europe and the United States have a new focus in lipidema, in lipidema. that is not volume, that's not uh, water or edema, but it's pain and inflammation. And the question is, or well, the new, let's say, the goal of compression treatment in lipidema is thought to be reduction of pain mainly, not a reduction of, of edema. And the question is, um, you have some data from ulcer patients, for instance, that compression treatment is able to reduce inflammation. So is that a goal in lipidema that we can reduce inflammation and by reducing inflammation, we can reduce pain? I don't know, but there's no data from, from studies on that. But. Yeah, uh, so in, in, in terms of pain, we have short-term uh, results with uh, the congestive lymphatic therapy, so we're, we were able to decrease pain. Uh, as far as uh, inflammation is concerned, there are some data that are indirect. They are coming from other studies, not from lipedema studies. Yes. And they and there are some there are some proofs that uh, comprehensive therapy could decrease inflammation, but I, I have not found any uh, form of uh, lipedema uh, clinical trial that was that that was able to measure uh, the decrease of inflammation in lipedema, and I think this is a real challenge. Uh, this is a real challenge as well. So extrapolating uh, uh, results from other studies, yeah, this is a good idea, but I think we have to catch the problem itself and we have to conduct uh, uh, these trials in lipedema. So I, can, I could not agree more. Okay, 
I see that there was a couple of questions which have been answered by uh, the previous speakers anyway, so we can go ahead just to keep the time because we are going well, let's say. So now for Sergio, just the very last presentation. Uh, I have one question, Sergio. Uh, I mean, you know better than me that veins are different from lymphatics and that's why we are trying to understand if we need different pressure at the end of the day because of fibrosis in the in the lipodystrophic tissue in lymphedema sometimes and so on and so on. So still uh, we cannot reply if uh, we need different pressure in vein disease and the lymphatic disease. And the second issue is bandaging because whenever we bandage, we can have different pressure. This has been clearly shown in many, many studies because with stockings, it is somehow pre-fixed and then we have the limb, and then we have the patient, and then we have the compliance. So there are many. That's why, what is your practical, let's say practical suggestion for lymphedema in bandaging and in, uh, and in stockings in the upper limb and in the lower limb? You know that you already gave us some suggestions, but to be very practical, because we have today many, many people who are also on the, let's say, on the daily activity just to have some suggestions. Thank you so much, Attilio. The topic of the veins and lymphatics is extremely intriguing. Uh, I don't know if we have already had the chance to talk together. Or actually, we talked about that. We recently identified, for example, the glycocalyx in the lymphatics for the first time up to our knowledge in the human. This is a huge uh, point uh, to make it loud and clear how veins and lymphatics really are a family affair, as Professor Parsh was uh, telling us. So when uh, you are asking me veins and lymphatics, I actually ask myself, is it the egg or is it the chicken? is like uh, when uh, they are asking in terms of hemodynamics is it ascending or descending maybe it's really pointless to focus on that aspect and we should just be aware that both it's exist it's and uh, coexist to answer to your first uh, comment maybe there is a mic that is uh, yeah. Yeah. a yeah. second yeah. topic to to go practical I would consider bandaging as the haute couture. So uh, something that is uh, custom made that you have to do just if you really know how to do that. So technically we do that in case of acute situations where we really want uh, to play at best uh, with the different components uh, of the pressure we can apply. But particularly in a time in which it's not so easy to have our patients coming to the hospital in the peri-pandemic time, I'm quite shocked that uh, adjustable compression wrap uh, didn't uh, go skyrocket in terms of, of use, because that's really the best opportunity in terms of self-management. And we really enjoyed last week a brilliant lecture by Professor Shingale on how to use the MONS in advanced cases. So again, uh, in practical terms, bandages are absolutely not to be abandoned, but to be used only in extremely expert hands with proper timing in the control. And we have now the great opportunity of adjustable compression wraps coming into the game. The question I have is about flatnet in reality, considering the cost and the long lasting disease. So I think we should really educate everybody to also use them when really needed and have proper compression uh, also with the round knitting whenever uh, possible, because you and also Giovanni showed us the great benefits they can give as well. OK, thanks. Ebra, if you want to say a couple of words, otherwise we can close the session. Just one, one very short question. Your topic was, uh, Sergio, your topic was pressure. But what is the role of stiffness in uh, compression of lymphedema? In, in, indeed, uh, I was, uh, and I'm still pretty angry with Attilio for this very challenging question that was hiding this topic. And for this reason, I included in the talk uh, the part related we should really know about uh, stiffness. I think uh, that it was uh, extremely interesting what uh, O'Donnell already showed us uh, in 1977, showing that we might have an impairment of the outflow that might require some extra hemodynamic help. And that's where I would see, of <laughs> course, a major role in stiffness. But at the same time, one size does not fit all, in my opinion, Everard, in the sense that when we are talking about lymphedema, the real question is, which lymphedema are we talking about? Are we talking about a soft sponge we can just squeeze? Or are we talking about a rock that we cannot really push on? Thank you very much. OK, so we are very happy to be on time. And uh, if ever agrees, we can give the word and the microphone and everything, the power to the next two chairmen. Is that OK for you, Abiraz? Yes, please. 
Okay, so now I invite Giovanni Most, who is also writing something on the chat board, let's say on the chat board. So Giovanni Most and Nick, we cannot hear you because you should unmute. <laughs> Nick, we can hear you if you want, because Giovanni <laughs> is silent so far. We can hear you, Nick, in case. If you want to start and Giovanni tries to unmute. Okay, hang on just a second. Uh, Giovanni, can you do your best to activate your microphone? We can uh, we can start while we wait for uh, Giovanni to connect. Okay, Nick. In case Giovanni cannot go ahead, you can uh, start with the, the very first okay. presentation to be on time. And in the meanwhile, Giovanni will try to solve with Lisa the issue. Okay. Sounds fine. The uh, the next topic will be physics of compression. I understand this is a video from uh, uh, Dr. Franceschi. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's correct. I will share it now. OK, uh, thank you. Compression is a major hemodynamic treatment of the venous and lymphatic insufficiency. It reduces the transmit pressure, increases the extraneous pressure. The aim of the compression is to increase the extravenous pressure, which reduces the transmit pressure excess in order to make the interstitial fluids drainage possible. It's due to transmural pressure excess. The DMA accumulation of toxic catabolites, hypodermitis, microtion. And in order to reduce the venous bed volume, excess and stasis. is the major parameter of the venous pressure variation. It doesn't change with the caliber, but only with the height of the column of the venous blood. So, Compression doesn't reduce the intravenous pressure, but only the transmural pressure. Okay. It's the sum of three pressures, gravitational, dosotic pressure. Valve incompetence impairs the dynamic pressuring of the hydrostatic pressure when working. Residual pressure increases when the big circulation resistance decreases and in case of arteriovenous fistula and in case of downstream obstacle as vein occlusion, direct abdominal or heart failure pump. Valvomuscular pump pressure increases with downstream obstacle and flow pressure overload when working in case of deep valve incompetence and closed or open deviated superficial shunt. The compression doesn't increase the venous flow, but it drains the interstitial fluids, reduces the venous bed volume and stasis, compensates the too low oncotic pressure gradient. Also, it reduces more the deep than the superficial veins caliber because the mean pressure inside the superficial vein is necessarily higher than inside the deep, otherwise it couldn't drain into it. Homogeneous compression. Immersion in liquid. Immersion in the liquid subject to gravity creates an homogeneous compression, whatever the surface regularity, which progresses vertically from top to bottom, according to the gravitational hydrostatic pressure gradient. Air inflated sleeves exert a compression by circular and homogeneous contact force independent of gravity. According to the Laplace law, P equal T uh, by uh, R 
the elastic or the inelastic compression P transmitted by the tension T is heterogeneous due to the different radius air of the limb circumference. For the same stretch force tension, the sub bandage pressure P decreases when the average radius of the leg increases. This transmission can be modified with paths that increase or reduce the pressure depending on the required pressure at the given point. We can thus avoid compressing the arteries, especially the pedal artery, by fixing pads on each side of the artery. Ischemia can be prevented by checking the foot flow with Doppler or platysmography in decubitus at the end of the bandage. Non-elastic bandage is a passive support because it doesn't exert any active pressure. It is a relative force to the pressure produced by the limb when its volume tends to overwhelm the volume of the bandage. Thus, the non-elastic and non-stretchable bandage resists the volume pressure of the limb and returns it. This happens especially during walking. Elastic compression is not passive, but active due to its potential shortening force, hysteresis and stores instead of resisting part of the pressure volume variation of the limb. For a of bandage pressure in laying position, an elastic bandage reduces more transmural pressure than elastic bandage during standing and walking. It reduces the risk of ischemia in laying position, which is essential in case of associ associated autoyopathy. Nevertheless, due to its better conformability, elastic compression remains preferable for all the cases where the TMP is not too high, which is fortunately the most frequent case. Unfortunately, the pressure of the anelastic compression decreases during the day when the edema volume of the leg decreases. The prior reduction of edema by elevation of the leg combined with the light elastic bandage limits this disadvantage. Doppler flow monitoring prevents ischemia. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Franceschi. Uh, we do have uh, questions at the end of the session, so uh, we'll wait to... Uh, uh, Giovanni, or are you able to... You, you just unmuted, did you? Yes, but I was, muted. I was unmuted also before. I don't, I don't know why it didn't work, but I had to disconnect myself and reconnect again, and now I hope it works. It's working fine. We're happy to have you. Perfect. I'm here with Alberto Caggiati, as you see. Uh, I see him. We are working together with another project. And I will try to share my screen now. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Not yet. Not yet. It may take a little bit. Now? Yes. Okay. Go full screen, though, if you can. Okay, perfect. I'm trying to do this. Go full screen. There you go. 
that should do it. So uh, I have no conflict of interest for this presentation. And I want to start from here. Arterial disease and diabetes are considered contraindication or no indication for compression in patients with leg ulcers. And uh, the, the, the problem is the fear of a compressing and already compromised arterial system, so reducing arter distal perfusion, or producing skin damages in patients that are, who are possibly unaware of them due to the severe neuropathy. So if you look at the data we have, compression therapy is contraindicated in 23 out of 33 papers in the Cochrane Review on venous ulcer when the ABPI is lower than 0.8. And in addition, addition these patients are often referred to the vascular surgeon. And, and this is still uh, the same at the present time. So the, the, the paper I, I, I showed you is it's quite old, but still now if you speak with the surgeons or, or with medic, many medical doctors, they are totally opposing uh, compression therapy in patients with arterial impairment. And on the other end, diabetes is also an exclusion criterion on enrollment of patients requiring compression therapy for venous ulcers. And also, no, not only in diabetic food, I'm not speaking about, about diabetic food, but I'm speaking about venous ulcer or mixed ulceration in patients with diabetes. Uh, diabetes is really a, a, a considered a not good indication for compression. And that's where you see that up to uh, six months ago, more or less, we had just one very old paper referring uh, to compression therapy in diabetes. And diabetic patients. I don't want to stay too much in, in compression in arterial mixed ulceration because we have so many data that I hope that everybody is convinced that uh, compression therapy can be applied in patients with arterial impairment, especially in, uh, uh, in the condition when arterial impairment is not severe. And uh, we have so many data that uh, they were adopted in guidelines, in guidelines and consensus street and consensus documents. What is clear uh, that compression exert uh, edema prevention or treatment, muscle pumping function increase, and, and uh, reduction of venous reflux. Maybe it's not so clear that uh, compression therapy, when properly applied, is able to increase the arterial inflow and, and exert an anti-inflammatory effect so contributing to reduce inflammation and pain. Arterial inflow actually increases uh, the, the um, compression therapy, sorry, uh, actually increases the arterial flow due to a reduction of arterial venous pressure gradient, a myogenic relaxation of arterial wall, and compression-induced release of vasoactive substances. And from the inflammation point of view, and I remember that uh, Eberhard previously uh, considered this point, uh, compression is actually uh, exerting an anti-inflammatory effect because it prevents release of mediators involved in the local inflammatory response and increase the production of anti-inflammatory mediators. And you see the references for this. On the other end, in, in patients with diabetes, uh, the fear of applying compression, there, there is a lot of fear of applying compression, but we need also to realize that uh, diabetes is increasing in incidence in recent years, and uh, we have a high prevalence of diabetic patients in patients affected by chronic venous disease and eventually venous leg ulcers. And in this patient, we need to apply compression. So what to do in this patient? For this reason, we uh, performed a sub-analysis of, our, of a, a previous work of us. Um, and in this previous work, we analyzed 180 patients uh, with uh, venous, pure venous ulcer and mixed ulceration. And many of them had a coexistent diabetes. So 
we tried to um, investigate if compression therapy can be safely applied also in patients with diabetes, with the venous and mixed leg ulceration, and uh, if uh, uh, compression can hinder or delay ulcer healing. Uh, this is the case series. You see that both in the group of venous leg ulcer and group of mixed leg ulceration, we have a lot of diabetic patients, but patients with the decompensated insulin-dependent diabetes were excluded, uh, as well as uh, patients affected by severe neuropathy were excluded. If you look at the characteristic of the case series, you see that regarding median ulcer surface or median ulcer duration, there are no, no significant difference. And obviously, there, are, there is a significant difference when you look at the ABPI, because it is uh, normal in patients with venous leg ulceration and it is reduced in patients mix, uh, with mixed ulceration, but uh, almost always greater than 0.6. We started with, uh, we continued the routine pharmacological treatment. Uh, local treatment was always the same in all the patients, the same foam dressing and cardiac somber powder in affected ulcers, sclerotherapy, foam sclerotherapy of the veins with the reflux directed to the ulcer area, and compression therapy independently uh, of uh, diabetes coexistence uh, was applied with a pressure greater than 60 millimeter of mercury in venous leg ulcer and lower than 40 millimeter of mercury in mixed leg ulceration. And arterial procedure were postponed uh, when the treatment was ineffective. If you look at the result of this, of this, uh, of this uh, study, you see that uh, diabetes uh, doesn't prevent ulcer recurrence. Uh, uh, ulcer recurrence, both in uh, patients with venous leg ulcer and, and mixed ulceration, uh, diabetes uh, delays a little bit the healing, uh, not significantly in patients with mixed ulceration, and slightly but significantly in patients uh, with the venous uh, leg ulceration, so, so with pure, pure venous leg ulcer. Also, um, multivariate analysis is taking into consideration sex, age, smoking habit, arterial hypertension, BMA, and ulcer surface. Uh, you see that uh, diabetes uh, is uh, delaying significantly, slightly but significantly, the ulcer healing in pure venous leg ulcer and not significantly in mixed ulceration. Pain. Uh, in both group, independently of diabetes, uh, decreases in mixed leg ulcer, it decreases uh, in, uh, in the slow, slow mode, so to say. And uh, no, no symptoms related to compression was, was, uh, was reported, so no specific safety issues uh, were encountered in, in this study. So it is still true that we need to uh, to to fear of of uh, compromising arterial system in patients with diabetes. You see that diabetic cones uh, are impacted by insufficient angiogenesis, uh, show decreased vascularity and capillary density, but adequate compression showed to increase rather than decrease arterial perfusion and prevent or reduce edema. And if you are able to prevent or reduce edema, you reduce the distance between uh, the arteries and the tissue, and you uh, certainly increase uh, the, the nutritional flow. Angiogenesis impairment in diabetic wounds is associated with a low level of or down regulation of VAGF, but uh, compression is able to uh, upregulate the AGF, thereby contributing to improve neovascularization. And this also a positive effect. And as I said, um, there are, there are uh, problems with inflammation in, in diabetic patients, but adequate compression showed to downregulate pro-inflammatory mediator and upregulate anti-inflammatory mediators. And then, last but not least, we have uh, uh, important data also coming from a study with uh, 
uh, elastic stocking. The previous one, my study was performed within elastic bandages, but this was performed with the uh, proper design stocking. And you see here that uh, in this study, uh, 94 uh, participants uh, with uh, a PID, uh, peripheral arterial disease, or diabetes, and the patient were affected by edema, all the patient, so some of them with arterial disease and some of them did diabetes mellitus, a class one or class two stocking, so class one you know from 18 to 21 millimeter mercury of compression, class two from 23 to 32 millimeter mercury of compression. They were submitted to a micro uh, circulation assessment uh, and uh, it was shown that in all the groups, uh, the microcirculation parameter would remain, remain stable uh, at all the points uh, that, uh, that were um, uh, taken in, into consideration, and also independent of the position of the patient. So no problem with microcirculation when the patient were elastic stockings. And you see no serious adverse event, a stable microcirculation, a high wearing comfort. So my conclusion is that moderate arterial impairment does not impede le legal serrealing when treated by compression uh, therapy. Venous legarts and mixed legarts in diabetic patient will, with a slight delay compared to similar arsen in non-diabetic patient. Compression therapy in this patient does not represent an issue, obviously provided that compression is properly applied and some experimental data on effectiveness in edema treatment in diabetic uh, or peripheral arterial disease patient by using properly designed elastic compression stockings. And I want to uh, uh, thank you for your kind of attention uh, from, with a spectacular view of the uh, best region in Italy that of, of course is Toscana. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for that uh, very unbiased comment, uh, <laughs> Giovanni. <laughs> um, so we will have questions at the end. As I mentioned before, I will introduce the next speaker uh, regarding compression stocking versus bandages after varicose vein treatment. Very interesting topic. I welcome uh, Dr. Lishoff to uh, do his presentation. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Very well, yes. Okay. Let me share my screen. Just a moment. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Can you see me? Can you see my screen? Yes, we're doing well. And I, I would point out that it seems the younger the presenter, the better uh, uh, facility with this uh, technological oh. equipment. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's start. First of all, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to make a report at this meeting. Uh, we can continue to talk about compression, about uh, compression in venous interventions, uh, venous surgery, comparing bandages and medical compression tokens. Uh, I have nothing to declare. Uh, so, compression after venous interventions. Uh, guidelines tells us that compression is still essential part. Uh, of venous treatment uh, that is stated in recently published guidelines and consensus statements. Uh, we can use compression after venous intervention to reduce post-procedural pain and to provide faster patient recovery. Uh, and guidelines uh, mentions that at least mild compression above 20 millimeters mercury uh, and the center compression is preferable after venous interventions. Uh, and according to this, And according to this, sorry, uh, we have to mention two brilliant articles. First one was published by Marcia Lagli in 2009. Uh, she shows that uh, essential compression has strong advantages by decreasing pain 3.5 times after venous interventions. And second one was published by um, Giovanni Musti, and he made a conclusion that in terms of uh, post-procedural pain reduction and complications, a uh, higher level of compression are more effective than uh, the lower one. 
and that strong compression can be achieved by inelastic bandaging or central compression systems. Uh, but also author said that uh, far fewer data, data are available to indicate the required duration of compression. Uh, and in continuation uh, uh, of this statement, we will switch to a recent article which was published, published in 2016. Uh, the authors have made uh, a systematic review which compression strategies uh, used in RCTs. Uh, they found that at least 14 different compression products were used uh, with at least six different pressures in seven different regimes with duration from two to 84 days. And the conclusion of this study of this article was uh, a lack of evidence as to the optimal strategy of compression uh, has resulted in a marked variation in clinical practice. There is no uh, evidence of any convergence of practice over time. Uh, and as a result, what do we have? Uh, on, the, uh, on the one hand, uh, after venous intervention in terms of faster recovery and post-procedural pain reduction, a strong and eccentric compression is recommended. Uh, and on the other hand, we have certain limitations in assessment of compression because there are as uh, many compression modes uh, as there are specialists who provide compression. Uh, in general, uh, there are two options of compression which could be used after venous treatment, uh, bandages which could be elastic and inelastic, uh, and medical compression stockings. Uh, bandages have a high stiffness, high pressure quality, while stockings uh, do not require special skills or training. They provide higher comfort for patients and it's very important. Uh, and uh, we need to balance uh, between these opposites uh, because compression after venous intervention have to be comfortable uh, with a higher working pressure and therefore stiffness. Uh, it, it shouldn't uh, require any training and it have to be uh, acceptable in patients' uh, everyday life. Uh, uh, and we made so why small so why we compared different types of compression, both uh, bandages and stockings after venous interventions in terms of how do they work in vivo. Uh, we made interface uh, pressure measurement at the level of thigh under different types of compression, eccentric and uh, uh, non-eccentric. Uh, uh, we also included um, an UAD in this uh, report, uh, simultaneous use of two compression stockings. It's a stocking kit. Uh, we named it stocking kit, with, uh, which consists of uh, two light hospital stockings uh, thrombix medi made by Medi Thrombix or Thrombixin with a pressure 18 millimeter uh, mercury at the level of ankle. Uh, these stockings provide a very light pressure at the level of ankle uh, and they are more convenient for patients. And also it's very easy to put them on. Uh, one stocking provide pressure during the night. Patient can easily take off one stocking uh, before he go into sleep. And the main reason why we decided to explore such combination. The reason is two layers, because two layers mean uh, increased pressure and stiffness. Uh, I will refer to article which uh, was published again by Giovanni Mosti in 2008. Uh, in this brilliant article, he showed that pressure and stiffness of composite bandage kit differ, uh, differ from uh, the physical properties of their components, uh, and that uh, multi-component bandages exert high stiffness due to friction between the multiple layers. Uh, so our results, it's very interesting. It's a diagram uh, of uh, pressure on the different type of um, compression uh, bandages and uh, stockings. Uh, first of all, elastic bandage. We used a regular medium stretch elastic bandage. Uh, as expected, it, it gives a, a good pressure if applied correctly at about 16 millimeter mercury on the level of thigh. It's very important, as, uh, as all we know, to apply bandage uh, correctly. Uh, quality of compression depends on, in this case, quality of compression depends on personnel skills. Uh, but as expected, elastic bandage has low working pressure and even more changes of pressure in some series, in some cases, were negative. Uh, uh, and remarkably that uh, cotton pad doesn't, essential compression doesn't significantly increase pressure under elastic bandage, uh, under the single layer elastic bandage. Uh, I think I suggest it's due to residual extensibility of bandage uh, after bandaging. 
And regarding two layer bandage, of course, we can receive high initial pressure in supine position here at about 27 millimeter mercury. Uh, and walking pressure, it does not significantly higher. This type of bandage remains elastic enough. Uh, but if we put cotton pad under two layer uh, elastic bandage, it starts to demonstrate more inelastic properties uh, with a higher walking pressure and stiffness accordingly. Uh, next, uh, light hospital stocking uh, with pressure 18 millimeter mercury. Uh, generally, I think it works like a single layer elastic bandage. It has low working pressure and in some serious changes again, uh, changes of pressure again go negative. Uh, it, it works like elastic bandage as I showed before. But surprisingly, it has some advantage uh, comparing to single layer uh, elastic bandage. Uh, with cotton pad, it demonstrates high walking pressure compared to elastic bandage. Uh, and finally, the main idea of this report, uh, it's stocking kit to light hospital stocking kit with uh, pressure 18 millimeters uh, mercury at level of ankle. Uh, that was the main surprise for us. It seems it worked like inelastic or low elastic bandage. Uh, with cotton pad, a central compression, uh, it provides not only higher pressure in supine position, but also higher working pressure and therefore, I think, therefore, stiffness. I placed a two diagram uh, on this slide for clarity. Uh, you can clearly uh, compare them. On the upper one, a compression kit eccentric, and the, on the lower one, two layer centric elastic bandage. Uh, these diagrams not similar, but comparing them, you will uh, find similar profile. It seems compression kit, as I mentioned before, works as low elastic bandage. Uh, so uh, my conclusion, uh, first of all, uh, about eccentric pad, uh, I think that it works only with low elastic compression. It doesn't significantly increase pressure under single layer bandage or single stocking. Uh, next, uh, two low pressure stockings have higher working pressure and therefore stiffness, of course. And finally, two stockings work like a two layer elastic or maybe even low elastic bandage. Uh, uh, I hope that this da data will be useful for you uh, because there is, I think that there is no general concept of compression. Uh, compression is a different products which can be combined in a certain clinical situation. Uh, compression could be elastic and elastic. It can have uh, different pressure and you can use it in a different modes and regimes. Uh, and you have to remember that uh, the result of compression of compressional treatment uh, will depend on how you use it. Uh, thank you for attention. Thank you. Thank That's you all. very much for a inter very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, we will have questions at the end, so we'll move on to the next uh, topic and speaker. This will be on pelvic congestion syndrome and the compression, uh, and I'm not sure who from Poland is going to present. Uh, is this, is this a, a live or a video? Looks like it's live. Uh, hello, can you hear us? Yes, we can. So we'll try to open our presentation and please tell so, us whether it's it's visible? Yes, it is. Okay, just a moment. Okay, is it still visible? It is, it's excellent. Okay, so uh, first of all, we would like to thank the organizers for the inviting us uh, uh, to this very interesting meeting. Uh, we have great pleasure to present our short speech entitled Pelvic Congestion Syndrome, Any Compression and Any Clue. This uh, appeared a big challenge given to us by Attilio and we tried to find uh, any reasonable uh, data in literature. So we had much difficulties and therefore we had to produce our own data. Although I'm pretty sure that uh, this data is not still not sufficient to provide a reasonable answer to this question from the title, but let's take a look. The background of our short proof of concept study was as follows. In our clinic, we use the compression stockings 
uh, as a routine practice after each procedure concerning the treatment of venous insufficiency. Since the majority of patients have no previous experience with compression, usually we advise some short test period before planned procedure. Just to familiarize with this German and to avoid unexpected problems with its use during or after the treatment. Surprisingly, some patients with pelvic venous insufficiency, especially those with combined leg venous insufficiency, report slight increase of pelvic pain or discomfort after the use of compression. So, to clarify this peculiarity, we have asked 20 women with already diagnosed PVI with or without concomitant insufficiency of leg venous system to respond to a simplified questionnaire. The assessment was performed before and after at least five days of the regular use of compression stockings. The simplified questionnaire was focused on main symptoms of uh, venous insufficiency, any pain or discomfort in legs or pelvic compartment, and leg edema. The self-assessment concerned the frequency and severity of aforementioned symptoms in both assessed periods. Using simple descriptive statistics, we have calculated the mean severity of pelvic pain or discomfort, leg pain or discomfort, and leg edema. And then we have compared these values before and after the use of compression in both groups. Using Mann-Whitney U-test, we have found statistically significant effect of compression on the reduction of symptom severity in regards to the leg symptoms, pain or discomfort, and leg edema, only in group with PVI combined with leg venous insufficiency. All other changes, although showing some decrease, did not reach statistical significance, possibly due to the very small group. Similarly, when we compared the frequency of leg symptoms before and after application of compression, in both groups, we, uh, there was observed some trend to their reduction, but only in patients with PVI and leg venous insufficiency, this drop reached statistically, statistically significant. Also, the use of compression resulted in reduction of pelvic symptoms frequency in PVI patients. Unexpectedly, two patients with PVI combined with leg insufficiency report increased frequency of pelvic symptoms after the use of compression. So, let's shortly summarize our so far findings. In patients with venous insufficiency, the wearing of compression reduced the frequency and severity of leg symptoms, and this change was especially pronounced in patients with insufficiency of leg venous system, but this observation is trivial. It should not be surprising either that patients with PVI, but without clinically overt leg veins insufficiency, when using compression, may experience some benefit in regards to leg symptoms. On the other hand, the increase in frequency of pelvic symptoms, although without significant increase of their severity, observed in some patients with PVI combined with leg veins insufficiency, we have recognized as quite interesting. To future clarify the phenomenon of co uh, we compared uh, the ad hoc effect of compression stockings on blood flow in two other patients with PVI and leg venous insufficiency, undergoing routine diagnostic venography. The MRI has shown that the retrograde blood flow occurring the varicose veins of upper tide was nearly stopped uh, after application of compression. More pronounced changes were observed in perineal region. Application of compression resulted in significant blood stasis, which was especially prominent in labial varices. Simi similar effect was observed in patients with PVI combi combined with leg venous insufficiency after bilateral saphenectomy in the past. The pelvic and the groin venography using compute tomography 
was revealed increased blood stasis in varicose vein uh, just above upper edge of compression stockings. Based on aforementioned findings, on this picture we propose an easy explanation for the observed phenomenon with the working title compartment hypothesis. Our concept is based on anatomical and functional connection between two compartments of below heart venous system, pelvic and lower limb veins. Without compression, it, in PVI patients with concomitant insufficiency of lower limb compartment, the pelvic symptoms may be mild and sparse, since the leg compartment may be a kind of safety fuse. As could be expected, due to high hydrostatic pressure in the latter, the leg symptoms will predominate. Now let's apply the compression. The external pressure, pressure will reduce blood retention in leg veins that will obviously decrease leg symptoms, but should increase blood retention in the pelvic compartment. Since the hydrostatic pressure in this compartment is much lower compared to leg veins, the change in pelvic symptoms may be experienced by the patient as less burdensome. Of course, we have to emphasize that our hypothesis is based on small group and short observation period and, sorry. Mm. Therefore, it requires more extensive research. On the other hand, it could explain why in some cases, the idea of dec uh, decreasing treatment, that means pelvic veins first, lower limbs, uh, lower limbs next, should better control the symptoms uh, uh, and possibly prevent future re recurrence of venous insufficiency. However, this is our next project. So, uh, sorry, we had some electrical problems. I hope it doesn't disturb the presentation. And uh, this was our last slide. And thank you for your attention and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And your and the electrical problem didn't disturb it. It was very, very interesting a presentation. Thanks very much. Uh, the next speaker and the last speaker um, may be the least enthusiastic speaker of the entire session. I don't know why I can't share the screen. And some, so, some, one of the speakers earlier went uh, left the meeting and then came back and then it worked. I don't know whether yeah, that'll help. Probably what, that's, that's probably what uh, we have to do. So you go ahead and. Uh, uh, OK. Yeah, I'll come back. OK. Um, Giovanni, I would like you to uh, take over with the questions if you if you're able to. Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, if if the chat is correct, there is just one question from me to to our friend Claude. And uh, my point is that uh, inelastic compression exert active compression. It is not true that inelastic compression doesn't exert an active compression, because if you measure the pressure under an elastic bandage, you see a very strong pressure. And if you apply an inelastic compression to a patient with leg edema and the patient stay sitting all day, at the end of the day, there are no edema at all. So uh, inelastic compression exert a true pressure. It, doesn't, it is not true that inelastic compression needs uh, a, a physical exercise to be active. May I, uh, I answer? D do you hear me? Yes, yes. very well. Okay. But you have two ways. It's a, a physical uh, um, concept, you know, when you press something, for example, on a rigid thing, you know, the resistance gives you back 
the, the, the force you give. And it's a retroactive pressure with an elastic. Instead of, that's why when you are lying down, for example, the pressure is very much lower than when standing and walking. And the variation of volume of the, of the car, for example, uh, can, uh, exerts a pressure against the resistant uh, anelastic uh, bandage, you know, and this uh, pressure is turns back. That's called a resistance force. On the contrary, uh, uh, when you have an elastic uh, compression, you have both. You have resistant, but what we call hysteresis. It means that when you stretch uh, the the uh, the bandage, you give force to your elastic bandage. And this force, even when we're lying down, etc., keeps active. That's why elastic compression may be dangerous when in lying position, in super position, which is not the case with the anelastic. That's basics of physics, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, you, you, um, this is the physics explanation, you know, uh, and uh, I think I have answered, uh, and for example, with the patients with uh, edema ulcer and so on, we, we elevate the foot very high, 50 centimeters, as you, you have seen, and we stay in this position for two hours. And the the uh, the edema is reduced very very much. At the moment, we <clears throat> we put the the compression anelastic, so that the effect is more durable, because the edema is already reduced. And we do say this since, since thirty years without any problem. That's why. And for the reason we. we we test every time the the arterial flow at the forefoot just to to know if we have a problem of arter arterial problem you know when we have finished to put the compression to make sure that we don't create an ischemia and with it we have whatever we, even with people with arteriopathy and so on we adapt the compression to the arterial pressure in standing in, in lying position that's my answer yeah uh, so claude uh, i i don't want to start the discussion on this because otherwise yes, we, uh, want, we could stay always here but uh, yeah. if you say in elastic uh, uh, bandage doesn't exert an active pressure it means that if you measure the pressure you could find the zero in in supine position and this is not the case because if you apply a good inelastic compression that you measure the, the, the interface pressure, you can easily have 60 millimeter mercury. And 60 millimeter mercury are not an inactive compression. They are a yes. very active compression. <laughs> in the interest of time, excuse me. In the interest of time, yes, we do you need to move on. You, you I'm can sorry, see this. We do need to move on. Yes, yeah, I know. I agree. I agree, Nick. I agree. When you press, at the moment so, you press, uh, can you, the you press uh, technical people the let me know if uh, Joe is is able to join us? Yeah, I'm. You can. You can. Yes. You should be able to see me. Go ahead and I hear can me. I see you now. Yes. Can, and you can hear me. I can. Okay. Now I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. And I hit hit the share screen button, and nothing's happening. Let me wait here, maybe. We'll get lucky. Um, let me try to to share the video again. Okay. Well, what's why do I see SG on the screen when I go to share it? LW. If I'm I can add this computer there. Hello, everyone. It's indeed a great oh, pleasure to be go. presenting this Voila. talk on behalf of the Center of Interdisciplinary Research on Compression. I'm sorry it has to be virtual. I'd much rather uh, see my friends in person, but I, uh, I'm, I'm just honored to be able to be with all of you 
on this occasion. As we begin this talk, we have to pay special homage to the master, Professor Hugo Parsh, and all of the knowledge and experience that uh, I have learned from Hugo, I'm being be indebted to him forever, uh, as well as the influence of St. Peregrinus in all of our lives. And also uh, the same for Giovanni, I'm indebted to him as well for carrying on the work of the master and, and adding to and providing much data uh, uh, that we find very important for wounds. And I must say that uh, either one of them could be <clears throat> give a much better talk, but uh, and I'm going to be presenting a lot of data that comes from them. But in any event, onward we go. And let us not forget the giraffe. These are my disclosures. We know that uh, the uh, short stretch compression and long stretch compression are important modalities. And unfortunately, too many people around the world are using uh, elastic compression for various purposes, including in wounds. And, and that I think is a mistake uh, uh, in many instances. Now, don't get me wrong. If you take a number of elastic wraps and you put one over the other, put two or three of them on, you get a more short stretch uh, type of compression. And of course, in the United States, that's the modus that's often used because they can sell these kits. Uh, and every time you come in for to get a wound change, you get a new kit and they put the, 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 uh, the four layers on and off you go. Uh, but in general, elastic compression is a very weak modality due to the high resting pressure, which is uncomfortable over time, and a low ambulatory pressure. Uh, so the bandage gives away when the patient walks and the edema increases till finally it reaches the saturation point, and then you have to really take the, the, uh, the bandages off uh, in order not to do damage. And the uh, difference between lying and standing uh, in an elastic bandage is nil, as you can see very clearly here on this Pico Press recording. On the other hand, inelastic short stretch compression has a low resting pressure, so it's comfortable at rest. can be on for hours or days even. It has a high walking pressure, so as, as the patient walks, the edema decreases, and the difference between the lying and standing pressure is normally over 10 millimeters. We also know that um, this has a, <clears throat> a, 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 an undesirable effect in that as the edema decreases, then the bandages tend to loosen, and that'll be one of the advantages we're going to talk about because the patient can self-adjust the uh, Velcro devices to avoid that problem. And we know that the modalities for short stretch compression are many, there's many roads to Rome as so often uh, told to us by our Professor Parsh. And Unis boot, short stretch bandages, multiple layer elastic bandages, Velcro devices uh, and, and, other, and other type devices, all can have that effect. Now, what about the giraffe? Most people are unaware that giraffes have venous pressure of more than 250 millimeters at their ankles. That's three times more than humans. However, giraffes do not suffer from lymphedema or venous disorders. Physiologists have discovered the answer is in the skin. Giraffe skin is inelastic, so it does not stretch. As their leg muscles contract, the veins in the legs of the giraffe are squeezed, forcing the blood toward the heart. Thus, giraffes are not susceptible to problems like venous disease and lymphedema, even though they may be on their feet for 24 hours a day. Remarkable. Now, Velcro compression are devices that utilize short stretch material, feature, of course, then features a low resting pressure, providing comfort at rest and a high working pressure. And as the muscles contract, the blood is forced out of the leg, just like the giraffe. And this decrease in residual venous volume and edema produces a decrease in leg circumference, but then you can adjust them and retighten the devices. And the static stiffness index of greater than 10, greater than 10 is ideal for treating edema. And this is ideal for treating many wounds once the exudative phase decreases. And here is a typical Pico Press uh, depiction of the <clears throat> Velcro device. And you can see with the pulsating that occurs during walking, this actually can simulate valvular closure. And that's a real advantage uh, that helps to heal these wounds. And there's another advantage. By lowering the venous capillary pressure, it encourages more arterial inflow from the leg, improving the circulation during the times when this patient is especially walking. 
Now we know that adjustable compression wraps are easy to apply as pointed out by, by our, our, our leaders, uh, Giovanni and, uh, and Hugo, and uh, the interface pressure uh, will stay the same because it can adjust the, the uh, devices to maintain that. And uh, although both devices are strong and have high pressure peaks and, and hemodynamically effective, the advantage of the Velcro devices over the inelastic bandages are there is no self uh, uh, management with the bandages. Uh, whereas, of course, with the uh, uh, and, and the resulting pressure loss, and of course, for the patient, the patient can readjust the Velcro devices and maintain that pressure throughout the treatment period. We also have seen data that goes back. I had the privilege to work with Ralph De Palma in 1998 to nine, and we actually showed that the uh, circuit device was significantly less expensive than treatment with the traditional Unaboots. Now there's uh, some data, but not a lot of data for adjustable Velcro wraps, 14 case series, one randomized trial and one uh, audit reporting on 192 patients. So the authors of this concluded that Velcro devices, although the evidence remains poor, they have the potential to improve outcomes for patients with venous ulceration and further good quality studies should be undertaken to evaluate these further. So now let's look at the real world, some, some clinical data. First, the circade cure. These devices are particularly useful because they can be kept on the shelf and when the patient comes in, you can cut these to suit the patient and fit it in the office without needing to send the patients to be measured at an outside facility. And, and this may have economic advantages. And here's what it looks like. You can see you can tailor it. And then uh, with these uh, the Velcro devices, you can adjust it to the patient and you can measure the pressure that you want the patient to apply. And uh, she even fits into a, a dress shoe. And here's another more sophisticated uh, application uh, from Giovanni. And here we have uh, the base layer of the bandages and then the, a, a, an adjustable strap device on top. And this particular one uh, use, uses clips and not Velcro. Now here's one of many patients I've had over the years with venous insufficiency induced lymphedema. This patient had a previous DVT uh, and after a while was confined to a wheelchair and developed open ulcers. And initially we started with short stretch bandages, but then over a period of time, we converted to Velcro devices. This is a very industrial level Velcro device and was able to, uh, uh, it took almost a, a year, but we were able to completely rehabilitate this patient and maintain her back to a walking status. <clears throat> this is a typical example of a low drainage wound that's very amenable to a Velcro device. And, and again, the same thing here. And you see, you might say, oh, well, we could just put a bandage on this. Look at the venous insufficiency here. That's not going to go away. Once that ulcer is healed, it probably was because of a traumatic wound. Uh, once that ulcer is healed, having those Velcro devices on to maintain that, uh, maintain that integrity and also treat this post-thrombotic venous stasis, venous insufficiency leg, is very, very important. Now, here's a patient that was sent to us with an ulcer that was long standing. And you can see here the excoriation around the ulcer. This is obviously a very chronic ulcer. And they were surprised it couldn't heal. Well, the answer was that the patient needed to be ablated. So, superficial venous ablation is very, very important. And once we did that, we were able to heal this patient using the Velcro devices and then continuing it long term. Now here's another case, and this was my fault. This was a 90 year old man that kept coming to our wound clinic in a wheelchair and I kept putting these wonderful bandages on that Hugo taught me how to put this compression wrap on. We were very proud of ourselves, only to have him take it off two or three days later and said, doc, I can't stand these bandages. We finally got the picture to stand him up, completely examine him and we determined that he had marked uh, venous insufficiency. And as a result of that, um, we sent him for venous ablation, and this is seven days post-ablation. And here we are after six weeks, and now we were able to put Velcro devices on to get him healed and keep him healed over the long term by keeping the Velcro device on. That was the biggest problem I had in my practice, you know, almost. You'd heal all of these things, and then the patients come back with another ulcer. Well, what have you done in the meantime? Where's your compression? You've got to use your compression. 
This is a patient who was a 43-year-old recovering addict with morbid obesity. And this wound that I'm going to show you required nearly one year to heal using short stretch compression, grafting, and a Velcro device. And then later, late in the course of her disease, we put her in a Velcro device for long-term care, and no recurrences were uh, present after two years. So here's the lesion, and here it is fully healed. And as I said, it was over two years and she's maintained her healing. Now, the long-term care of these patients using Velcro devices is really important. Many of these patients are aged, aged and cannot properly don and doff stockings. And 30 to 40 millimeter stockings, especially as they get older, they're pretty hard to deal with. Arthritis, extreme overweight may preclude, even preclude their use. Maintaining wound healing and vel with the Velcro devices is an important ongoing tactic to prevent re recurrences. And these devices were used successfully in all of the patients in this presentation. And here is another really important point. More than 20% of people have mixed arterial and venous disease, and many patients with ulcers have mixed arterial and venous disease. Velcro devices are ideal in providing a low resting pressure and a high working pressure. And they're easily adjusted. If the patient's exhibiting discomfort, they loosen it. If they're doing fine, they can tighten it. And as the swelling goes down, then readjust it. You must make sure that the perfusion pressure of the leg is greater than the resting pressure of the devices. So you need to measure it. Hugo's been trying to teach us, and Giovanni as well with a Pico press. You have to have a dose for compression. So in these patients with mixed disease, you must know the pressure that you're putting on those patients' legs. And actually, as I said before, the arterial inflow may increase as the blood is pumped out of the leg by the, the, uh, the veins, then the arterial inflow increases due to a decrease in the venous capillary pressure. So in conclusion, Velcro appliances should be considered in selective wound patients, especially when the exudate levels decrease. Inelastic properties are ideal for wound healing. Daily adjustment maintains excellent compression. The devices may be removed for wound cleansing and then reapplied with good pressure. They're an excellent choice for preventing recurrent ulceration. They're cost-effective compared to conventional bandage systems under many the circumstances, and of course, ideal during COVID-19 to minimize human contact. So I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Please visit my social media platforms, and um, I hope you all have a wonderful day and a great meeting. Thank you very much. Joe, thanks. We're going to go to uh, some questions for some of the others, and I'm going to jump back to you when we're finished with that, uh, just so we don't lose you. Um, Giovanni, I had one uh, question for you specifically. When when we have these patients with venous leg ulcers and you're applying a, uh, a compression of adjustable device, can we rely on the pressure that's applied uh, that, that is indicated on the device itself, or do you think it's necessary to measure the pressure that we actually we put on? Uh, Nick, when in, in my clinical use, I don't ask the patient to measure the pressure. I just ask them to stretch the, the, the drops as much as they can, provided the device is, is not becoming painful. So I don't really bother of the compression measurement because in venous disease, as much compression you use and, and the, the better the results. Uh, the only problem is with the mixed ulceration because if the arterial impairment coexists, it is difficult to, to ask the patient to stretch as much as they can. In this case, uh, they can use the, 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 the special card that is in the, in the, together with the device. And uh, we ask them to adjust the pressure not higher than 40 millimeter mercury. And what about but the patient? What about the patient who has uh, peripheral neuropathy, the di diabetic patient? Uh, it's it's the same. It's the same. If 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 they have uh, a, a so to say a significant neuropathy, so they don't have any sensation at all. Uh, even in this case, it is important to measure the pressure and to stay with uh, with the correct application because sometimes uh, it can happen that you stretch uh, a band more than another one, and this is not fine in diabetic patients. But if they 
are able to feel something, even if they have a minor neuropathy, so to say, they can stretch the bend, the, the, the wraps uh, as, as much as they can. Okay, thank you. Let me I ask, have, go oh, ahead, Attilio. I would have a question to Giovanni, if possible, yep. very quickly. So Giovanni, we are dealing with special patients. I mean, uh, mixed ulcer, diabetic, arteriopathy, and so on and so on. So at the end of the day, we still don't know if we should take in consideration the pressure, I mean, the systolic pressure or the basal ankle brachial index, or which I have been suggesting for the last few years, the post-exercise ankle brachial index. What's your opinion? To say you can apply compression and this is a good pressure you can use. Because that's a major point, especially for those who are not so experienced, let's say. So for me, the most important parameter is the uh, perfusion pressure. That is the pressure you can measure at uh, the ankle. And in case of calcific arteries, uh, if you have the chance to measure the toe pressure, <coughs> it is, is, a, is a, a correct measurement. And the, the pressure at ankle must be higher than 60 millimeter of mercury. And in this case, you can apply the compression provided you are exerting a pressure below 40 millimeter of mercury. Uh, don't forget then when you stand up, your your pressure, your leg pressure will increase. Also, the arterial pressure will increase uh, the same way that the venous pressure increases. So, if you have a, a, a supine pressure of 60 millimeter of mercury, I mean arterial pressure, you will have 180 millimeter of mercury in standing position, and this. Uh, uh, is uh, absolutely safe even even if the patient has a, a a a compression on the leg so the most important point is uh compression pressure i don't uh, think that abpi is so correct because abpi of 0 0.5 can come from an arterial pressure the, uh, the brachial pressure of 100 and an ankle pressure of 50 and in this case, apply a strong compression is dangerous. And the same 0 0.5 comes from a, a brachial artery of 180 and, and a, a, an ankle pressure of 90, and you have still uh, 0 0.5, but in this case, application of compression is quite safe. Okay. Um, let me ask uh, uh, Dr. Lishoff. I just had one question about uh, uh, I noticed the uh, the compression on the uh, groin uh, with your patient were was uh, uh, not particularly high in the groin. Do you have any tricks on how to get that compression up that high? Yeah, Nick, thank you for your question. I think that regarding uh, our modern modalities in compression, there is no any. A uh, useful option to enhance uh, the pressure in the area of the groin. And even more, I think that uh, we don't uh, have to uh, increase the level of uh, compression in the groin. Uh, uh, many, many years ago, when we just started uh, endovenous procedures, we were afraid of uh, some, maybe about the thrombosis uh, in the areas of femoral junction. And we've thought about the compression in the area of uh, groin. Uh, and for the first time, we used um, um, uh, stockings, um, not stockings, uh, very high stockings with a belly. I, I, I yeah. don't know how to. Pantyhose. Pant so, so, thank you. Yeah. Pant yeah. yeah. Uh, but year by year, we, we switched to the normal, to the regular uh, stockings, and uh, we. I don't see any, uh, don't, uh, I haven't seen any advantages of uh, compression in the uh, area of groin. Uh, and I have to say that uh, there is one uh, thing that we have to remember, it's a patient compliance and patient comfort. Uh, Stockings uh, is not very comfortable for patients. Uh, and the pants, uh, they are much more, uh, they have much more lower comfort for patients. And many patients, they prefer to use one stocking. They even don't uh, use uh, stocking on the contralateral uh, side on the other, on the other leg. Uh, we are in this uh, very uh, difficult field uh, when we think that we, use, uh, we have to use uh, a, a very high compression on both legs. 
and patient don't want to use compression at all. And we have to find a compromise in this uh, question. OK, Giovanni, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, I, I have a, a question for Dimitri. I like very much your presentation. I completely agree with you. Uh, we always use compression after venous procedure, but what do you think about uh, all these papers denying the importance of compression after venous procedure? Because you know that we have uh, a lot of data uh, suggesting compression after venous procedure and uh, more or less the same number of data against compression after venous procedure. So do we have any comment on this? Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, I have to say, first of all, the, that it's a very tr tricky question. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, a few months ago, I, I, I had a possibility to talk with uh, some European specialist from France. Uh, he made, uh, he published an article uh, where they compared, uh, where they compared uh, compression after venous surgery. Uh, first of all, they used uh, very light compression for one day, and after that, uh, in, a, in another group, they used uh, very light compression for three days. Uh, and in the, uh, and, and, and the third group, they uh, didn't use compression at all. So they compared a very light compression with no compression, otherwise no compression with no compression. And I think that it's the main reason why uh, why uh, there is so many um, decisions, so many uh, ideas that compression doesn't work and we uh, uh, cannot use it. Uh, uh, we know that in many countries uh, surgeons prefer to use uh, very light compression. I, I, for example, I've showed in my uh, presentation that we prefer to use two stockings, at least two stockings, so sometimes we use uh, one uh, stocking with a pressure uh, 18 or 23 millimeters at the level of ankle, uh, and uh, uh, also with another stocking on the same leg. Uh, and I think that the, the, the answer is a low quality of compression. Um, I, I, I can't believe that compression doesn't work. I think that the main reason is low quality of compression, and if you will um, you know, check all these articles uh, where the conclusion is that compression doesn't work. Uh, the main reason is very low compression and very low compliance uh, of patients to compression. In uh, because of time, I'd like to move to the uh, Polish group and uh, ask them uh, the uh, SEEP classification of their patients in uh, in that study that they did. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so the problem with PVI patients is that they actually uh, do not uh, fit to the CAP classification because we have uh, some patients with PVI uh, which have varicose veins in the pelvic region, but actually they have no symptoms or uh, let's say slight symptoms from the uh, leg system and uh, no varicose veins on the legs. So actually they should be classified as uh, C1 because uh, for example, they have some uh, spider veins and without any varicose veins, but actually they have uh, large varicose veins in the, in the pelvis. So uh, I think uh, at least for this group, uh, CAP classification doesn't work. But of course, for the for the group with uh, combined PVI and uh, uh, varicose uh, veins or leg venous system insufficiency, uh, they were uh, C2. Okay, thank thank you. I I think I'm hopeful that. Uh, the classification for pelvic venous insufficiency patients will be uh, forthcoming. That's they're working hard on that, and that's uh, getting closer to publication. Uh, thank you very much. Now, Joe, I would like to get back to you. Uh, do you have a comment after your presentation? Yes, I'm, first of all, I, I apologize for running over. It seems you can't keep me quiet, but there's always so much data that I'd like to share with you from my own experiences. And I think that um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really uh, uh, 
uh, I wouldn't say disturbed or upset is the wrong word, but it's it, th these things I've presented, we've known them for years, and yet it still seems to be resistant. And I go go back uh, with that beautiful lecture by Giovanni with the with the diabetes and 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 also his subsequent discussion and questions about ankle brachial index. You got a pressure of 200 uh, systolic with somebody with hypertension, so the ankle is 100. So, I mean, there are a lot of things here and it's just, uh, I think these meetings are very important and it's a real honor to be able to be a part of it. And I apologize to some of the uh, people there that probably know more about this than I do, but I think this information continues to need to be distributed. Great, thank you. Giovanni, do you have a follow-up? Uh, uh, um, Joe, you know that I totally agree with you, uh, but you have a question. So uh, please try to respond. The question is, uh, if a breathability of uh, velcro wraps uh, are taken into consideration in, in your studies, breathability, breathability issue. Oh, preferability. Yes, well, yeah, it's a matter of education because many old people have a transpiration issue. Transpiration issue Pref of fatigue. Preferability, breathability. Preference, yeah. preference. No. Isn't that what you're asking? No, 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 no preference. Breathability, uh, respiration, re transpiration. Breathe. Breathability. breathability. Oh, the breathability of the devices. Yeah. yeah, so that's very important. You see, uh, uh, an integral part of those devices is using a proper liner. And uh, the uh, the liner is a great is a great help for breathability. And uh, the nice thing is that those they can be taken off you could put your leg up and take it off and air out your leg so but most of the time we find that with the liners the secret of using the proper liner for these uh, for these devices and the liner has an additional side effect which is positive of applying foot pressure in certain cases which also then helps to control certain swelling situations okay thank you and did you have any issue with um the ability of, of patients to apply and self-apply and self-readjust the device or you don't have this kind of problem? Well, quite the contrary, because I try to work, you know, most of these are older people and people that can't bend over and people that have arthritis and so forth. So all of those problems are there for Velcro devices. And that's a very good question. So you have to have people working together. So a, a, a person that's disabled would like sit on the edge of the bed and then someone would sit here like I'm sitting in a chair. I have a bed right here. Um, so somebody would sit on the bed, I would sit on the chair and then working together, we would put them on and you could put them on very quickly that way and much faster than trying to deal with a stocking. And uh, I think that that's an important issue uh, for these patients is that they have to, uh, teamwork is good. Now for people that want to do everything themselves, then, you know, then nothing is going to be okay. Uh, Uwe, I, let me get, Uwe, I, let me get back to you, Uwe. Um, we, we are at, Two minutes after the appropriate hour, uh, do you want to keep going with questions or comments? Uh, yes, we still have a little bit of time, so please uh, go on. If, if, there is, there I, is, I would there recommend, is, from, I think, um, our, our friend from France would, uh, has Claude a Francis, question. Claude right at his end, yes. 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 Claude, no, please. Yes, I would just uh, say that I, I agree uh, Hundred percent with uh, Dr. Caprini about the analytic compression. On the other hand, the the problem of the arterial uh, uh, the, the ischemia ischemia is prevented not necessarily with a previous measurement of the pressure. It, you just have to put your 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 Doppler, you know, on the forefoot like this on the forefoot and here you have a flow, an arterial flow. And w when you have uh, exerted your uh, compression, you know, and you test, if you keep a good flow, it's okay, whatever the pressure. And it's very easy. And we can do it with uh, a, a, a pencil, a, a, a Doppler pencil, whatever. It's, it's the, it's not necessary at all to, to, to measure 
before the pressure at the ankle because the flow goes to up, down to the to the toes. So the forefoot is important and you you test the flow on really here on the forefoot between the toes and you have a flow with a high frequency three Doppler. That's that's the point and it's easy and it is finished with this. Well, I, just I don't like understand. I, I, I don't understand why people don't do it. It's it's so easy and, and the, rational. The problem the problem is when the forefoot is covered by compression devices. Ah, you 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 can you, you can manage a, a hole for to measure it, and most of the the bed edging doesn't bend edge at the same time the toes. They stop. And you have uh, all the time uh, room to to go just before uh, below the 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 system b below the bandaging. You know, it's it's quite easy. It's really not a problem at all. And since thirty years, we do this, and you have no problem. Joe, do you have and a comment? Right. Yes, I think this is something that's really really important, and I'd like to just uh, repeat it and re-emphasize it. The, and Hugo said this to me a long time ago, and then Giovanni, there is a, you have to have a dose for compression and you can't just blindly do things. And, and what the, the, the comments from our French colleagues, brilliant. And also uh, toe pressures, uh, you have to do some measurements. You can't just, uh, uh, this is, you would never give a drug without a measurement. And we need to measure measure what we're doing with the patients. And then the other thing is, just to, to point out is, don't forget a lot of people take uh, uh, multiple elastic bandages and put one over top of the other. And of course that will increase, make them more inelastic. Okay, Achille? Uh, and I would like to, to, to ask uh, Dr. Caprini a question. Yeah. Uh, do you reduce the, the edema before uh, putting the the bandaging because in my experience i reduce the edema before putting the bandaging the 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 anelastic bandaging it's easier and the so that the pressure remains high all the day and they keep it for one week we just change them each week not each day and you have very good results so that that's why these these 10 12 minute presentations are are very difficult because that that's an incredibly important point and in the United States for a long time now it's getting a little better uh, uh, velcro devices were very expensive and that's why I leaned a lot on that circai cure because we could do it in the office but if you don't get the initial edema down like that then if you uh, it's very important to use good uh, short stretch compression to reduce the edema to get it down to a good size so the fitter when they fit with the velcro devices can get a better fit and something that will be more long lasting very very important point but but there is another point with the, another advantage of velcro devices because when you use velcro devices you can use them also in edema patients and when the edema is reduced you can stretch more the straps and and you you overcome the problem so you can start from the beginning right but this is a case like if you saw that lady in the wheelchair with that big swollen yeah, yeah. edema that's not one that you would start with velcro that's i think that's what we're talking about here you'd get that and that's what we did we got that leg down to a size that we could get a good velcro on it and then uh, because the velcro uh, uh, actually uh, Circade made a industrial type of Velcro that was, uh, was over three hundred dollars, and so, uh, but but it was very successful and it got this patient back on her but, feet walking. But uh, 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 Joe, the Juxta cure, you can cut it and readjust the new, to the new leg size. So this is very easy with just one device. You don't need to change the device. Right, I'm talking. One of my issues is. Is long term, months and years, and it just, uh, the cure won't last long, months or years. And whereas some of the newer devices, and now the newer devices with clips, 
will last a long, long time. So it's, I think we're both right. We're talking about, it, it's a matter of degree, but I think it's important that we use all of our resources. And uh, when you can see that you can start right off the bat with the Velcro, that's fine. And we do that many times. So, you know, you and I are just talking about the same thing, I think. It, 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 may, it, it results, it, it all depends on the individual patient. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nick, if you agree, you can close the session. We give just a couple of final words. Uh, I was going to leave the final words to you, Atilio. I th this has been an outstanding session, and I really appreciate all of the speakers uh, from from various regions that we don't necessarily get to hear from very often. So, at the, uh, whoever put this together, if it was Atilio, you did a wonderful job. Okay, so just the final words to me, and then we will close the set, the whole uh, web conference. I mean, very simply, that uh, very uh, it was not so easy from the technical point of view. We apologize, but somehow we got the goal to gather many people to discuss about interesting topics. I think uh, this seminar will be has been recorded and will be put on our YouTube search channel. This is important to remind. And uh, last but not least, I do hope it is the very last time we meet virtual because we need to discuss much, much longer also out of the session, which is not so easy at the moment. So anyway, we did our best and each speaker did a very good job, let's say, and the, the moderators even more to be somehow good to everybody. And now I give the final words to Uwe. Thanks again. Okay, thank you all uh, for your great presentations and the active dis discussions, especially um, Atilio for organizing everything so perfectly. In addition, with our two ladies, Lisa and Fanny. Thank you all. This is a, was a great scientific program. Um, I would like to uh, say the biggest pleasure for me today was that Hugo Patch joined us. And Hugo is really the godfather of Cirque. That's why it's a big pleasure that Hugo is here. And I thank you, Hugo. I thank you for your lifetime work on compression. You did a fantastic job. You are a mentor of all of us. And I only um, can say we love you all, Hugo. And stay healthy. This is the key for all of us. And now let's try an experiment. Um, it is a webinar, um, but we have a long tradition in ICC, International Compression Club, and um, Cirque, that at the end of a dinner, we sing a song. It is not easy to sing a song on a webinar, but let's try it. Uh, you know, the biggest singer ever was Enrico Caruso. I know that some of our Italian friends can sing at least on nearly on the same level like Enrico. Uh, it's just a small technical problem. So I think we should all sing a song for Hugo. I don't know if it is technically possible, but if you comm commute all possible microphones, at least of our Italian friends, as it's an Italian song from Giovanni, Attilio, Sergio and um, Alberto. Uh, but maybe, uh, Lisa, you can try to commute as much as possible microphones. And we try it, uh, especially Giovanni, Attilio, and Sergio, and Alberto. But all you can sing is a song we all know. And it's just a song for Hugo. And uh, that's why I, I give us five seconds to prepare it. Please <laughs> commute your microphones. Please do us the favor, just for Hugo, a song for Hugo. Okay. I, I think the, I think I think the easiest one is Volare because and every this is my proposal. So, so if you don't mind, let's try it all together. So Attilio, Attilio is the organizer, so he needs to start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I help Attilio. Okay, start together, all together. Volare, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Thanks, Hugo. Thank you, Hugo. You, you are really friends. Enjoy, uh, especially the Christmas time with your family. Stay healthy until we see each other again face to face. Thank you. Auf Wiedersehen. Ciao. Wiedersehen. Thank Ciao. you. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.